small. All those worlds, even just men,
Good morning. For those of you who can't read my name tag, my name is Fred Hayward. My present role at the church here is head gardener, so enjoy the, your visit here. Uh, I welcome in particularly everyone, but I want to especially say welcome to the members from St. Paul's United Church. It was so pleasurable to get and meet not only those that we've met as part of our quartet, who are members of the octet, who are part of our collaborative group of eight churches here in Oakville. In particular, uh, I'll single out one person in particular. It was a pleasure, uh, St. Paul's, to meet Marjorie Boyce. I taught her two boys at Pine Grove back in the 60s. So it, it's nice to hear that there are others of us that are still here and walking into church. I'm not going to mention you, my, uh, Harold, that uh, you were there as well. So, yes. But you're younger. Okay. In particular, I hope that you'll join us after church, after our worship service. We have lots of cake, more cake than I'm sure any of you will help us consume. The church is, will be uh, not operating until the civic holiday in August, but we will have lots of activity here. STEM camp is operating in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, next week, the Great Big Theatre will be operating in Lusk Hall. I, sorry? Okay, yes, you want to know that Ashley is here in the church office every day. Ken is back from his two-day holiday, and he'll be here as well. So the church is open. Our service next week will be at Munns. And just a reminder that when we meet at Munns for the next two weeks, uh, we start at 10, in half an hour earlier. So that to be prepared to arrive there at 10. Uh, welcome back, a particular our speaker, our, sorry, uh, officiant. Uh, our minister today, uh, Reverend Mervyn Russell, fresh back from Scotland. He'll tell you lots of stories as well as wife Pat. So welcome back, Mervyn. The candle has been lit. The light of Christ, our Christ candle shines through each and every one of you. May it shine and continue to shine in everything you do. Please stand now and let us sing in recognition of Canada Day tomorrow, our national anthem, O Canada. Good morning to you all. I think as Fred has mentioned, I'm Irvin Russell, retired clergy. So let us join in our prayers together.
Holy Hidden One. Once again, we have come to be with you and one another. We come with expectation. Through the hymns, prayers, scripture, and the preaching, we want to experience your living presence. Be reassured of your promise of acceptance, reassurance of our worth, and of your unending goodness and matchless glory. We come wanting to be strengthened in the conviction that you are our God and we are your people, worthy to be your witnesses in the world. We come wanting the peace that is based on knowing that nothing can separate us from the bond of your love in life, in death, or beyond death. Once again we come, open to being yours, now and forever. God, the selfishness, greed, and violence of the world obscures you. We allow these evils to dominate our thoughts and feelings. We absorb their influence and they determine what we say and how we behave. We tend to use them to defend ourselves and to fit in with others. We become corrupted. We lose our Christian identity and appear as hypocrites in your eyes and in the eyes of the world. Nevertheless, however much we sin, your grace endures. Keep us certain of that so that we can become aware of what we're saying and doing. Be willing to try to separate ourselves from what dishonors you and hurts others. And instead, learn to speak and behave in ways that express devotion to you and caring towards others. If we really want to be in better harmony with God. If we are really willing to try, be open towards God, God will help us. If we repent, that is, God will forgive us, starting right now. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we'll join in singing our first hymn, number 389 in Voices United, God is Here.
The responsive reading is Psalm 30. The responses will be on the screen. I will extol you, O God, for you have lifted me up. You have not let my enemies triumph over me. O God, my God, I cried out to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me back from the dead. You saved my life as I was going down to the grave. Let all your servants sing praises to you and give thanks to your holy name. In my prosperity, I said, I shall never be shaken. Your favour, O God, has made me as firm as any strong mountain. You turned your face away from me, and I was greatly dismayed. I called to you. I made my appeal. What profit is there in my death, in my going down to the grave? Will the dust give you praise? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O God, and be gracious to me. O God, be my help. You turned my mourning into dancing. You stripped off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, so that my heart will sing your praise without ceasing. O God, my God, I will give thanks to you for me. <coughs> The Gospel reading today is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5 and beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly my daughter is at the point of death come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live so he went with him and a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him now There was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She'd endured much under many physicians and had spent all she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately, aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher 
any further. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but is sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside, took the child's father and mother, and those who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately, the girl got up, began to walk about, for she was 12 years old. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. Through these words, God's voice is heard.
The doctor that Patricia and I go to belongs to the Egyptian Coptic Church. So her receptionists in the main have been members of that same community of the Coptic Church. <clears> there <throat> have been several over the years, but there is one I shall always remember, Miriam. This is because of the story she told me about a car collision that she was involved in. Her car was literally run over by a truck. She was seriously hurt and she could not get out. She was afraid that the car would catch fire and explode. She was desperate, so she called out several times, Jesus, save me. And she said, he did. She realized she could still access her phone, and so she dialed 911, and in a few moments the fire brigade was there. And using the jaws of life, they cut through the metal of her car, and she was lifted out to safety. The two people we heard about in our scripture passage today were desperate. One was the president of the local synagogue, not the rabbi, but the president, that's to say the man who was responsible for the, <coughs> the maintenance and the organization of the synagogue. <coughs> the other was a woman with a gynecological problem. The president of the synagogue had a beloved daughter that was dying. And this woman had a discharge of blood which made it impossible for her to mix with other people. <clears throat> they both heard that Jesus can heal sick people. So each one decided to try and benefit from Jesus' special abilities. In doing so, the respected president of the synagogue sacrificed his dignity and he goes down on his knees before Jesus and pleads with him to help his daughter. The sick woman, she joins the crowd, she jostles her way to get close to Jesus and daringly she puts out her hand and she touches his coat. What has made them act <coughs> in the way they did? Both are confronted with great loss, but clearly in so far as they are seeking healing, both of them are convinced that their losses are ones that are not in harmony with the life-giving and sustaining purpose of God. What could they do to get God's help? That's when each of them independently thought about the traveling, healing rabbi from Nazareth. So they set out to find him and get his help. <clears throat> So the president of the synagogue, instead of giving direction to other people, he pleaded for Jesus' mercy. The woman, who was barred from mixing with others because she was told and she believed that her bleeding would corrupt other people, dares to lay her hand on the coat of the holy man. Both of them were courageous. They were prepared to take big risks. After all, Jesus, we've already heard in Mark's gospel, has not been received very favorably by leaders of synagogues. Would he be rejected? 
The woman didn't know if Jesus would be angry with her because she, as a polluted woman, had touched him without his permission. Both, however, experience Jesus' mercy and help. <clears throat> so what does this story have to say to us who read or hear it? Surely it is that when times arrive in our lives, when we know we are in danger of losing beyond our control, something that is vitally important to our health, harmony or happiness, our experience of justice, mercy and peace, or when we are concerned about these things happening or may happening to others, God wants to relieve us of these evils and will respond positively. Of course, many of the disturbances, the problems, the irritations which we have to deal with day by day, we can put right by ourselves, relying upon our own experience, our own judgment, our own reasoning and willpower. But in circumstances beyond our control, we need greater help. Then, like the president of the synagogue, the bleeding woman, or indeed Miriam, we need the guidance of God to find God's helper. God's helper who will help us. Maybe we have a concern about our physical or mental or spiritual health, or the health of someone else. We or they are constantly feeling tired, in pain, anxious, depressed. Then it's necessary for us to seek the medical advice of others. Advice that we can in turn share with another person perhaps who is suffering. Prayer, of course, is helpful and necessary. But God's healing and liberating power works through other means as well as prayer. Maybe we are desperate about a relationship that we're in with an intimate partner who's abusive. Or we have a sister or a brother or a mother or indeed even a father or child in such a relationship. Again, when we're seeking God's help, we must seek God's human helper. We will want to hear their advice, maybe also get their practical help so that we or the one that we love can escape from these assaults. Maybe we're sad and angry and depressed about some situation in society or in the world in general in which people or other creatures are being degraded, deprived, displaced and destroyed. Where the environment is being laid waste, polluted or, or poisoned. Then we have to find God's helpers for actually working on these issues and find out how we can contribute to bringing about a more responsible and respectful, a more just and peaceful situation. In all these instances, like the sick woman who had tried many doctors before she came to Jesus, and the synagogue president who continued to take Jesus to his home even after he'd been told that his daughter was dead. If at first we don't succeed, we will be determined to try and try and try again. 
like the president of the synagogue and the sick woman, doing these things requires conviction. It requires courage. It requires taking action. It requires determination. And these attitudes are all part of the fullness of faith. Jesus isn't nearby on earth anymore to lay his hands on those who are desperately sick. Nor so close to us that we could even catch something of his power through his clothing. But we do have his servants. People who as healers have access to a power based upon caring and reason and which is to a greater or a lesser extent in some harmony with his and are able to help people to be restored to health and strength, dignity and justice. God is very generous in sharing out his gifts. And often they're shared with people who are not perhaps always the best in character. There are indeed some few people who can heal by laying on of hands still. I remember going to a conference on healing at Master University and hearing about such a man, hearing from such a man. And I went to speak to him afterwards and said, uh, would, it, uh, would it be possible for me to do something like that? He said, it's not if, but when. And of course, there are many more who by their prayers can support the convictions, courage and commitment of those seeking healing for themselves and for others. God wants all humans, indeed all his creatures, to enjoy health, harmony and happiness. God wants everyone to live in dignity, justice, development, and peace. That is what we have learned from Jesus. Always, always, always be convinced about that. So when disaster threatens or arrives, we can have the God-given conviction, courage, and determination to seek and find those persons and organizations who can help us and others to be restored to greater fullness of life. God dwells with and through human beings. We also learn that from Jesus, the son of Mary who lived in Nazareth. And that really is one of the great meanings of Christmas. The word became and becomes flesh. The president of the synagogue, the sick woman and dear Miriam had their faith in God's genuineness and goodness confirmed. And so can we. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now we're going to sing together hymn number 350, O Changeless Christ.
Please be seated. We are now going to ask the ushers, please, to take up the morning offering.
Let us pray together. Holy God, you are the source of the gestures, thoughts, words, and deeds that are in harmony with your creative, liberating, and uniting purpose for our world. Use our prayers to strengthen your influence. Today, ruler of the universe, we pray for Canada. This nation in which the events of our lives have placed us. We're thankful for its beauty, for the plentifulness of its lands, rivers, animals, vegetation and minerals. We thank you for its prosperity, its political and legal systems, its education, health, and welfare services. We're thankful for the variety of its peoples and the peacefulness of its communities. Help us to respond to its challenges of poverty, racism, addiction, global warming, and misuse of social media in an understandable, transforming, and uniting way. Enable Canada to be a helpful and peace-promoting neighbor to other nations, particularly those where there is severe division, deprivation, and conflict. We remember in silence those who we know who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit. May we assure them of both your and our enduring love and of our constant willingness to do what we can to relieve their distress. Strengthen the caring, courage, and commitment of your church to communicate in word and deed your creative, liberating love for all the world in all its divisions, distress, and destruction. And all our prayers we mention and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to, are we saying or singing the Lord's Prayer? Singing? Yes. Speaking. Speaking the Lord's Prayer, right? Okay, so we're joining in saying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And our final hymn for this morning is hymn number 700 in Voices United, God of Freedom, God of Justice.
Holy Spirit, of the Holy Father and the Holy Son. Enlighten your mind, liberate your spirit, and gladden your whole life with love. Go in peace. Amen.